let's continue now our discussion. Okay, so can you guys give me a thumbs up if you guys are already in front of your computer? Okay, pretty good. Miss Kyla. Okay, Lenny, Trisha, Langpawen, Emily. Okay, maybe half of you. All right, so this is where we've stopped in part one. So the next one right here is firewall and what is really a firewall is. So again, it could be a hardware that can be found on a router or it could be a software that can be found on to our computer itself. Okay, so this one protects uh, our network resources from intrusion okay? or any unsolicited website or access to our uh, internet okay? or to our terminal itself. So uh, the main role of the uh, let's see, firewall is to limit us to access a website that is unsecured, okay? Or to access a certain uh, protocol, certain um, application maybe. So yeah, there are times that it can uh, be stopped by a firewall, but mostly uh, it's only dealing with uh, our browsers, okay? So this one protects us from outsiders and to restrict also employees access to sensitive data such as payroll or personal records, okay? So we are using proxy server wherein a server outside the organization's network that controls which communications pass in and out of the organization's network, wherein of course this proxy server is hardly being uh, or under secured security by a firewall. So it has a hardware firewall and then a software firewall at the same time. Okay, since this server contains a lot of personal information. All right, so again, when you say firewall, so it could be anything that is happening in and out uh, to our computer, okay, with the use of internet, okay? So yeah, it can still protect you if your firewall is, firewall is turned on. However, if that file is being transferred locally, okay, it didn't pass through the uh, internet or over the uh, internet, then firewall is useless. Okay, there's also there's a big chance that your computer will uh, get compromised. Okay, and then we also have here unauthorized access and use. So you see unauthorized access, you didn't allow that person or someone to use your computer. Okay, and then when you see unauthorized use, so let's just say that yes, you allowed that person to use your computer, but you didn't allow him to use that specific application, okay? Like for example, uh, you let someone to use your computer, but that someone is already, you know, checking if there is a personal information that he can get. So of course that is uh, unethical, okay? That is why we have unauthorized uh, using here versus unauthorized access. All right, so here are the things that you can do to a lesson, okay, the, uh, call this one, the probability for your computer to be, uh, you know, having an authorized access and use. So number one, of course, you have to turn off those uh, shared libraries and devices, especially this one, okay, media devices. So you should not allow the devices on the network such as TVs and games console to play to your shared content, okay. So yeah, that is uh, one tip for you to avoid uh, having this uh, kind of uh, legal action and authorized access and use, okay? So that is the reason why we have a lot of access control, okay, before you'll be able to uh, use that computer. So if you have the username and password or anything that proves that you are really the user of that specific terminal, then congrats. However, if you're, you didn't know or you're not allowed to have access to that specific computer, then uh, that is the reason why we have access control, okay? To avoid someone or to limit someone who's not 
uh, really authorize to use your computer or uh, access your computer, okay? And then we also have here audit trail, of course. This one records uh, both files, successful and ac unsuccessful access attempts. So with this one, you'll be able to know who are the people who are you know, act, trying to access uh, your computer, okay? Audit trail. So we have here the common types of access control. We have, of course, username and password, sometimes passphrase, where in, of course, this one is, has a very long uh, combinations of words, combination of uh, sentences, punctuations, okay, that you can think of. We call that one passphrase, okay? You even have CAPTCHA, where in uh, CAPTCHA stands for completely automated public uh, Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. So with this, uh, you can limit the users of your, let's say, website okay, or of your application uh, by having a bot uh, application being run to your uh, application or program. So CAPTCHA is uh, separating bots into humans. So in here, uh, you are making sure that the users of your program or of your game is really a real human being, not just a bot or just a uh, tool or application that is consuming uh, the space of that uh, user, okay? So here's an example of CAPTCHA, where in course only as humans can identify that this one is really K-I-L-L -L CAPTCHA, okay? If it's a bot or a computer, uh, we don't have that algorithm yet. Okay, so uh, marami nang gumago actually. Lots of programmers already trying to crack this one on how to, uh, you know, identify the text behind this one. But uh, most of them are failing since this one is really, or you have to consider a lot of uh, factors like the size, the, the curve of it, the color, etc., etc. So it's uh, very difficult to uh, develop an algorithm wherein you can read the text behind of this capture. Okay, or you can have a possessed objects like badges, cards, smart cards, and keys for you to be able to have an access to that specific thing. Okay, or you can just have a PIN or a personal in, uh, identification number. So in our case, we have our uh, ATM card, and at the same time, it will ask another uh, access control wherein a PIN. Okay, so it's a double authentication. And then if it's not a possessed object, then it might be uh, something that is within yourself or within our body. Okay, like for example, a fingerprint, a biomet like uh, iris, scanner uh, what else uh, actually many more okay let's go to the this one okay so we have fingerprint we have face recognition we have hand geometry we have voice verification we have signature verification uh, which is uh, quite unfamiliar because this one is you know inaccurate due to of course uh, humans are not uh, consistent with their hand rhythm. And then lastly is iris recognition system. So we have a lot of ways to have a uh, access to that specific uh, thing or application or for, before you can enter to uh, a certain uh, building or company. Okay, so here are their definitions. So I will not explain those anymore since they are very straightforward. Okay. And we have here digital forensics, for in this one is also called cyber forensics. So take note that we have uh, policemen, we have uh, soldiers uh, here in, uh, of course, in our real world. But we also have, let's say, cyber forensics, who are also, let's say, policemen, who is knowledgeable when it comes to computer, to track someone, let's say, a hacker or a cracker or a spy or anyone who's doing a bad thing uh, when it comes to uh, computers, okay? So we have 
uh, many areas for cyber forensics. That one could be uh, under law enforcement, or that someone could be a criminal prosecutor, that someone could be under military intelligence, insurance agencies, information security departments, and many more. Okay, so those are just the uh, areas under digital forensics or cyber forensics. Okay, and then software tap, which is very, very common. Again, if you are using a crack version or illegal copy of that application, then that, uh, that is already a software tab. Okay, so of course, if you steal software media that is under software tab, if you intentionally erase as programs, so this one is, you know, like uh, uh, in real world. So if you stole something, of course, uh, that object is now within your possession. Okay, so it cannot be found anymore on where it uh, belongs or where it stays before. So just like this one, like for example, you copied that certain application and then at the same time you erase that program or application, then that is still under software tab, okay? Or illegally you registered and or activates a program. So like what I mentioned about a while ago, this one is like a crack version, you're cracking an application, then that is already a software tab, okay? Or illegally copies a program. Okay, so here are the things that you can do and you cannot do. Okay, this one can, uh, or mostly can be found under a license agreement. So I know that uh, most of us, including me, of course, do not uh, really read or doesn't really read what this license agreement contains. Most of us will just scroll down and then uh, check the uh, accept uh, the license agreement. But one thing that you didn't know is, let's say, uh, they now have an access to your computer wherein uh, they can share your uh, data or your personal information. So you cannot do anything anymore since you've agreed to their license agreement, okay? So that is why sometimes we have to read the license agreement, especially if that application is not that familiar or not popular, okay? So here are the things that you can do and you cannot do. And if you disobeyed this, you cannot do, okay, the, the things that uh, you cannot do right here, then you are now under software tab, okay? And then information tab, of course, uh, contains confidential information, mostly a bank account uh, number, the PIN number, uh, username, password, or anything that is uh, important or personal uh, information, okay? So those are most commonly the one that is being stole, okay, by a hacker or by a cracker. So how to safeguard that information? So of course, initially it's in a plain text. And then once you apply this one, then let's just say that 50% uh, your uh, data now is safe. However, of course, uh, there are still ways to decrypt that data. So encryption is a process of converting data that is readable by humans into encoded characters to prevent unauthorized access, okay? So let's talk more about encryption. So initially, of course, we have plain text wherein it's unencrypted. So it's in a form of readable data. And then once you converted that one or transform that one into a uh, something that is an unreadable, okay, we call that one ciphertext, okay, or it is now the encrypted or scrambled data, okay, or encryption algorithm, okay, wherein it is the one that is being used uh, to convert something, okay, hindi lang basta sinabi natin, uh, encryption, yun na yun, okay, so there's a lot of kinds of encryption, okay, we call that one encryption algorithm. So one example of that one is transposition, another one is substitution, uh, the third one is expansion, and then the last one is compaction. So those uh, uh, encryption are uh, different ways or different types to be exact. So they have their own ways to encrypt your data. Like for example, transposition, so uh, adjacent characters are being swapped. Okay, so from this 
text into this. And substitution, so each letter replaced with another. So from this plain text into this cipher text. Okay, for expansion from this to this. So we've just inserted a letter uh, every character. And then lastly, we have compaction. So every third letter is being removed. Okay, so we were able to remove letter T, A, and then O. So this is the remaining uh, letters. Okay. And many more. So take note that those are only the simple encryption algorithms. Okay? So, yeah, those are just the common. So do not use those uh, kinds of algorithms. Those are just uh, actually more an example. Okay? So there's an 80% chance that your data is still not safe. Okay? So here's the scenario wherein you can... Uh, or how do we send an encrypted data? So of course, initially you have the uh, plain text, and then second is you have the uh, the application to encrypt that uh, file or data. So once that one is encrypted, then from plain text it now becomes unreadable, just like this. Then of course, uh, the receiver has a key also or an application to reverse uh, what you did on that plain text. Okay, so if we have encryption, we also have decryption. Okay, so it will be decrypted into plain text again for that person to be able to read uh, what, what is inside of your uh, file or your data. Okay, and then uh, we have actually one algorithm, a famous algorithm before Okay, we call that one Caesar cipher. So it is an encryption algorithm that replaces each character in the plain text with a different letter by shifting the alphabet a certain number of positions. So like, for example, we have computer. Uh, from this, it will become like this. So it's just shifted uh, by one letter. So uh, the next letter to C is D, the next letter to O is P, and so on and so forth until uh, you were able to come up with this kind of text. So this one was named after Julius uh, Caesar because it is believed he used it in his private correspondence. Okay, so that is why uh, Caesar cipher is one of the most common and simple and basic way of encrypting data. Okay, so even you can actually do this one, you know, without without a special tool, okay, you can encrypt your username and password, okay, and then only you knows how to decrypt that one, of course, unless you told someone that this is how to decrypt uh, that data, right? Then another one for you to be able to avoid, you know, having an information theft or uh, being, uh, or your, your information being uh, uh, still by someone, then you must uh, check if that website has a digital signature or a digital certificate. Uh, mostly, actually, it's just in a form of digital certificate. Uh, but for some websites or for some uh, articles, uh, they have digital signature. Okay, so it is an encrypted code that a person or website or organization attaches to an electronic message to verify that uh, the identity of the sender is legit. Okay. So this one is often used to ensure that an impostor is not participating in an internet transaction. So digital signature is mostly, or can yeah, can be mostly found on emails, wherein you attach your digital signature, uh, saying that it is uh, really coming from you. Okay. So of course, it is now your job to verify or validate if that digital signature is really legit or no. Okay. So it's still. 50-50, uh, not sure. But uh, having this one, a yield certificate, so this is actually a notice that guarantees a user or a website is legitimate. Okay, so let me just show this one to you guys. Uh, I'm using a Opera browser. So if you will click this one, it says here, certificate is valid. So there are some websites wherein certificate is invalid, meaning uh, that website uh, is unsecured, okay? So there's a big chance that the information that you are putting in there is not safe, okay? Meaning they can, or someone can see 
uh, whatever uh, is your activity on that specific website. Okay, but if it has a certificate, so 90%, this one is already safe. Okay. All right. So again, uh, we have this uh, lap icon right here, where if you click that one, it will show you the uh, certificate. And then we also have HTTPS. So this is also another uh, way for you to be able to check if that website is legitimate or no. So if it doesn't have HTTPS, so maybe let's say it's 70%, uh, it's still safe. Okay. And then if it doesn't have this uh, lock icon right here, wherein you cannot see the digital certificate, then let's just say that 20%, okay, that your uh, data is still safe. Okay. So yeah, 80%, your data, is, uh, your data now is uh, vulnerable. But there are also chances that uh, that website is just you know, doesn't have an app security. All right. So we have here hardware tab and then hardware vandalism. So hardware tab, you guys remember this one, you know, the act of stealing digital equipment. And hardware vandalism is the act of defacing or destroying digital equipment. Okay. So if you are in UC right now, let's say you are in UC right now, a laboratory of a computer, and then uh, you change the uh, settings of that specific terminal without uh, telling the, let's say, the instructor or someone who's managing that computer, then that is already hardware vandalism, okay? Or if you destroyed or deleted a digital equipment, okay, so that is already under hardware vandalism. So we have here hardware tab vandalism and failure, wherein uh, tips you can do to avoid those three. Okay. So for physical access controls, of course, it's common sense to lock your doors and windows, especially if you know uh, no one's around uh, with that device or with that computer. And you can also install alarm if you want. And you can also uh, add more physical security devices like cables and locks, okay, to avoid hardware theft. Or uh, you can add surge protector, okay. So this one is for hardware failures, okay. Or you can uh, add UPS, okay, for additional uh, safety of your uh, or the components of your computer. So you, if you have UPS. Uh, it will give you maybe 30 minutes of time to save your work and to shut down your computer property. Okay, so this is just a backup uh, electricity. And then you can duplicate components or duplicate computers. So this one is applicable if you are uh, a rich person. Okay, just to avoid, uh, you know, uh, losing all of your uh, important data or important uh, uh, information to your computer. And then fault tolerant computer, of course, do not buy a super cheap, okay, like uh, the quality of that component or that computer is not uh, good anymore. So yes, you were able to save a lot of money, but the quality and then the performance is not that good anymore. So it's more uh, prone into hardware failure safeguards. Okay, so any questions so far up to this point? Hardware to vandalism and failure. Question or clarification? Answer. How about the others? Lapo, sir. Answer. Answer. So, yung iba. Anyway, so again, uh, you guys can eat as long as we cannot see you and then we cannot hear you. Okay, kasi baka lalo kaming magutom kapag narinig namin tapos nakita namin sarap-sarap ng ulam mo. Sa joke lang. Alright, anyway, 
So let's now proceed to the next one. So we have your backup. So you guys already know what the backup means. So we have additional, let's say, hard drive wherein you are, uh, you've duplicated all of your information from this into another hard drive. Okay. So in that case, uh, even though uh, your original uh, hardware is uh, destroyed or uh, let's say you get corrupted, so you're still safe because you have a backup. Okay, so uh, yung iba, sinisib nila sa uh, physical hard drives, and then the others is trusting a company. Okay, so pwedeng uh, Amazon, pwedeng Google Drive, pwedeng uh, OneDrive, pwedeng Cloud. Okay, so we call those cloud storage. Okay, so actually pwedeng, ah, uh, secured naman to, especially if that company is uh, already uh, maybe famous okay? or matagal na yung uh, anong tawag dito? Parang matagal na yung uh, I forget the term pero parang matagal na sila sa industriya. Okay? So they were uh, already being trusted by many people. So, yun na yung mga companies na mahirap ng uh, uh, pasukin or mag-shutdown kasi nga uh, pinapangalagaan na nila yung pangalan nila. Okay? Like iCloud, Google Drive, you know, the uh, big companies. Okay? So, we have categories for backup. We have full, differential, incremental, selective, and then continuous data protection. So, we will discuss those uh, later on. But for now, let's say... Uh, this is your, you know, the one that we have here, grandparent, is the original uh, data that you have in your computer. So once you created a copy or a duplicate, we call that one parent. So once you created another duplicate or another copy, so you now have two copies, you know, just to be sure that uh, hindi, uh, paano ba? Para lang siguro, hindi madaling mawala, okay? Okay, or talagang meron at meron kang backup just in case something happened. Okay, so we call that one now child. Okay, so this is your second uh, backup. Okay, your first backup and then your second backup. All right, so here are the definitions of the types of backup. So we have full backup wherein it captures all of the files and media in the computer. So from the word itself, full backup. So yes, this is the fastest recovery method because all files are saved, uh, are saved. However, of course, since you are doing full backup, this one will take very long. So this is the longest backup time. And then we also have your differential backup, wherein this cap is only files that have changed since the last full backup. So as you guys can see, this is a combination of full backup and then differential backup. So you have to perform a full backup first before you can apply differential backup, wherein uh, it will only copy the changes into or from the last uh, full backup that uh, you perform. Okay, so advantage this is a fast backup method. It requires minimal storage space to backup. Okay, kasi nga yung mga uh, na iba lang, okay, or yung mga nadagdag or nabago lang yung kinakapi niya. Okay. So recovery time, uh, recovery is time consuming because the last full backup plus the differential backup are needed. Okay. And then we have here incremental backup and then selective backup. So if you're going to ask me, those two are actually uh, the one that is most practical, I guess. Because in incremental backup, this one only cap is uh, only the files that have changed since the last full or incremental backup. So let's just say that uh, you perform selective backup first. You, you're only backing up a certain file. And then after that, you have to perform now incremental backup. So once there is a change okay, or adjustment uh, from that uh, selective backup or that specific file, then it will only copy that changes. Okay. So this is also the fastest backup method actually. Okay. Kasi hindi siya full partial lang, and uh, parang differential backup din siya. Okay? 
And then select the backup from the word itself. You can only choose a specific folder, one or two folders that uh, you wanted to backup. Okay. And then lastly is for the rich people, wherein uh, the most expensive and requires a great amount of storage. Why? Because this is a real-time backup. Okay, so mayat maya, uh, nagba backup siya. Unlike differential, incremental, and then selective, you can set this one every 30 minutes, uh, every hour, uh, twice a day, once a day, once a week, once a month, okay, depending on your configuration. All right, so I hope you guys were able to uh, get an idea regarding with types of backup. So next thing right here is a wireless security. So you guys already know this one. So just by, uh, you know, uh, being here, being uh, connected right here right now to uh, via Zoom, of course, you are connected to a router. So it could be via uh, cable or via uh, Wi-Fi okay? or wireless access point or WAP. Okay, and then we have your ethics and society. So if we have ethics as a human being here in the real world, okay, we also have computer ethics. Okay, so how do you how do you act or uh, how are you as a person? Okay, actually to be exact, how are you as a netizen? Okay, so what is your uh, characteristic if you are in front of your computer? So to be exact. Uh, sabi na nating uh, sobrang sobrang yabang mo kapag nasa computer ka kasi walang nakakita sa iyo lalo na uh, fake pa yung account mo okay dami account lang yan okay so diyan pa lang mapapasok na yung ethics natin computer ethics so uh, uh mayabang ka kasi hindi ka nila naahawakan ka agad and one more thing hindi pa ganun ka uh, in uh, well implemented yung cybercrime dito sa Pilipinas. Pero meron ng iba. Pero sa glit nga lang, may nakukulong na mga one month, two weeks, three months, I think one year na yung pinakamatagal okay, when it comes to cybercrimes. Pero meron at meron na. Unlike sa ibang bansa, talagang uh, sobrang higpit nila. Once na nalaman nilang uh, gumamit ka ng illegal transaction at si uh, ATM card, nakakulong pala yung mga transaction mo, then uh, kulong ka agad ng Tatlong taon, apat na taon, limang taon. So, medyo mahababa na rin yun. Okay? Anyway, so when you see computer ethics, uh, this is your moral as a netizen uh, in front of your computer, mobile devices, and any uh, kind of device that can connect to the internet. Alright? So, your thoughts. Pwede mong i-check yung sarili mo if you are really ethical or unethical. Okay, so we have 20 questions for this one. So this is not a requirement. Uh, it's just for you to check yourself. Okay, so I'll leave that one to you. And then we have here ethics and society. So we have intellectual property, intellectual property rights, and then digital rights management. Okay, so for you to be able to relate regarding with this one, we have our uh, properties, right? Like for example, I have my phone, I have my laptop, I have my uh, TV. So those are physical properties. Okay, but when I say intellectual properties, those now are the properties that you have on the internet. Okay, so hindi natin siya nakahawakan, pero nandun lang siya. Like for example, you were uh, able to come up, uh, you were, uh, yeah, you were able to uh, develop or come up with a game. So ikaw yung gumawa, you're the one who has to uh, write to change or to distribute that specific property or that game, okay? So it could be anything. It could be an idea, it could be an invention, it could be an art, it could be writings, uh, processes, it could be company and product names and logos. So anything that can be found on, you know, on our computer, uh, someone owns them, someone created them. So that uh, is intellectual property or IP. All right. So since we don't have enough time again, so we will just continue the rest on the part three. Okay, so don't you guys worry, just 13 more slides and then uh, we're done. Okay, so goodbye for now and see you guys on part three.